David R. here. Today I'm going to talk to you about this book, Convicting the Innocent, edited by Donald S. Connery. Donald S. Connery also wrote this book here. This one was based on the Peter Riley case, but this book is focused on Richard LaPointe. Although other people are mentioned in this book, other wrongfully convicted ones, but Richard is the primary focus. This book was published in 1996, so I go to this website here to give you updates on the case. Some background on Richard LaPointe. He was born with Dandy Walker syndrome, and this is a rare congenital brain defect that affects the cerebellum. It also affects coordination, speech, social intelligence. Uh, this case began on March 8, 1987, with the rape, murder, strangulation of Bernice Martin. She was 88 years old. She was stabbed 11 times, and the killer attempted to burn the evidence. She was on a couch. The couch was on fire. Richard was the one who called 911 from her neighbors, and he was questioned by police, and so were a lot of others, but there was no arrest. So two years later, the police are sitting on this, and they decide, well, Richard is our guy. I guess because he had the same blood type as the killer, but not DNA, just blood type. I mean, a lot of people have the same blood type. I don't know, but anyway, that was their justification. They call him up and say, would you like to come down to the police station for just a little chat? Never do that, by the way. He says, okay, but he doesn't drive, so an officer picked him up and took him to the station. At the station, there are two rooms that are devoted to Bernice, and this is called the Bernice Martin Task Force, as if they would even do such a thing. I mean, come on. There's a lot of maps and charts and lists and diagrams, and on one of the list of investigators, the, the names Friday and Gannon come up, these are characters from the show Dragnet. Obviously, all this was fake. In the interrogation room, Richard finds out he's the primary suspect, and the police say they have considerable evidence connecting him to the murder. He's interrogated for nine and a half hours by three different detectives. He has no lawyer. The interrogation is not recorded. He signs three confessions, and in one of those confessions, he was told that maybe he blacked out. He doesn't remember doing it. That's the same thing that happened to Peter Riley, that, you know, in this book here. He was told that maybe you blacked out. It seems to be a common thing that cops use, so don't believe it if they ever use it on you. And another uh, confession, he was like, well, if I was there and I did it and the evidence points to me, then I did it, but I don't remember being there. So the police said, if you confess, we'll let you go home. So he confesses, but they let him go home, which is kind of odd, right? Because how do you, how can you just say, hey, I'm going to let this psychopathic killer go home to his wife who has cerebral palsy and his 10-year-old uh, son. But also, while he was at the police station, police were interrogating her, his wife, at home. And they had told her that, hey, if you don't cooperate, we're going to arrest you and take your son away. Now, people with disabilities, they are scared of this because it seems to always kind of be in the back of their minds that maybe this could happen. And so this frightened her. So anyway, Richard goes to work the next day, and then he, once he's done from work, he goes home, and then he is arrested. And bond is set at $500,000. And... Eventually, he is convicted. He is convicted of capital felony murder and eight related charges, and he's sentenced to life without parole plus 60 years. In the aftermath of this uh, arrest and conviction, his wife divorces him, and his in-laws disown him, and a lot of things go wrong, but some things go right. There are people who were at the trial who form a group called the Friends of Richard LaPointe, and they eventually get him exonerated. So to make a long story short, 26 years later, he is set free. 26 years, he had to stay in prison. 
So he is set free, and then eventually the charges are dropped because his DNA wasn't at the crime scene. So some observations. Police obviously knew he was an easy mark, easy arrest. He's easily coerced into making false confessions. They knew this. Another thing was that uh, they knew he wasn't a real killer or else they wouldn't let him go home. The real killer was a raging maniac. Richard is definitely not such a person. In the afterword of the book, they suggest four things for reform. One would be a confession should be considered worthless if there is no corroborating evidence. Second is that police should be required to videotape the entire interrogation. Three, people with mental disorders or mental disabilities should have somebody with them that can help them answer questions. And four, there should be a substantial payment to those who suffered at the hands of these law enforcement professionals, so to speak. So anyway, that's all I got. Talk to you later. Bye.